with some internal values. And uh, I was talking to Ivory Jr. I told him, pray for me because I need the power of God to deliver in a simple way these things that I, I wrote in this paper. And uh, we all need the power of God to understand. The Bible said that only when Jesus opened their mind, they could understand the scripture. Otherwise, they would have an Amen. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, the topic today is the debtor's prison. You heard of that. There was in history some famous prisons. Nobody would have loved to be there. The, those prisons were specialized in, uh, in keeping the debtors. Well, uh, the, those, the tortures that were practiced in that place made them a person to never think again of, uh, of treating debt lightly. Debt is not a financial transaction. Debt is a moral transaction. To pay or not to pay means to honor or to betray the trust that you've been honored with when you got the loan. So it's more, way more than a financial transaction. It's something connected with your conscience, something connected with your relationship with God and with people. It's way more than that. So we're going to hear today about the, that famous parable Jesus told about the man that was owing 10,000 talents. That's an astronomical sum. We, we don't need to talk about that. That's an impossible one. And you wonder how could a man make a debt of 10,000 talents? Friends, that man was not a man on the street that went to a bank and uh, borrowed those money. That man was hired by the, by the master. He was working in the, in the company with the master, like in Apple or in uh, like Microsoft or whatever, is uh, Ford factory or others. He was hired by the master. He was working with him. Uh, those 10,000 talents didn't represent a loan. It was not a loan. It was an astronomical sum entrusted to this man to invest. Like the, like the master, they give the talents to one gave five, to one gave three or four. It was entrusted to him to invest and to use it. But he wasted absolutely everything, maybe on some luxury products for his wife or on gambling or on other things like that. Like a, that gentleman in London that worked for the bank and, uh, and misused the funds uh, in the billions. It's frightening. It's frightening when you think that somebody can play with the blood or the education or the bread of millions of people. One person doing that. This man well, that was that kind of an irresponsible man that wasted 10,000 talents. And now the master called them all to have an account about their investment. And of course that man was in minus. His report showing that all the investment fund was completely wasted. And he was empty handed now in front of the master. And uh, the Bible says that he was so irresponsible that he fell on his knees and he didn't ask for mercy. He asked for time. Give me time. Absolutely irresponsible. That man would not process in his mind the, the amount of debt he had there. Give me more time. <coughs> he wanted even to deceive his master down during only while on his knees. He was trying to deceive. Give me more time and I will pay back everything. That was absolutely impossible from all points of view. But please observe something that is so obvious. The Bible said that the master the, uh, looked upon him and had pity on him. And because of that, he forgave all the debt. Did that person 
did that servant ask for forgiveness? No. 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 We have to understand this very well. He didn't ask for forgiveness. He was forgiven. Did he thank for forgiveness? Yes or no? No. no. Say no, brothers, because there is nothing in this in the Bible text that would, would indicate toward him thanking for that. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And he left. He left the place. I want to make it very clear and simple to all of us. Salvation and forgiveness of sin is the pure initiative of God. Amen. There is no contribution by my confession, by my situation, by nothing of this kind. According to Romans chapter 5, God took a decision to forgive all sins in Christ Jesus. So every single sin committed or uncommitted yet is forgiven at this time because of the decision of God. Unilateral decision. Now I have a question for you. Will all these people be forgiven or not? No. Why not? As long as forgiveness of God is like the atmosphere that surrounds planet Earth. Amen. We all breathe. Yeah. Yeah, I can't die if I don't breathe. But the atmosphere is still here. I have no excuse for my death. It was a decision, unilateral, foolish decision for me to choke myself and I would not breathe. Yeah. But the atmosphere was here. The forgiveness of sins, the grace of God, salvation surrounds the planet Earth like Amen. the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. Still, not anybody will be saved. Not anybody will be forgiven. Why? The Bible says all those that appropriated for themselves the forgiveness of God is theirs. If you believe God, if you believe that your sins are forgiven, then forgiveness is yours. Yes. If you refuse to believe that, Forgiveness is here, but it's not yours. You will never be forgiven because you rejected or refused the gift of God. Together with the gift of forgiveness, with the real acceptance of the gift of forgiveness, comes transformation. This man was forgiven, but not transformed. So, forgiveness that is not accompanied by transformation in whatever area of life is transformed in unforgiveness. What happened with that man? As soon as he came out of the master, completely forgiven, he met his friend and acted violently against that man for a little that that man had for him. The man pled with him with the same words he pled with the master before. But while the master forgave him that astronomical that, he did not even pay attention to the words of his friend pleading with him. That man was a realistic man. He said, if I would have a little more time, I can pay back. It was a small debt. I need a bit of time. That was true and real. But he wanted that in that very moment, now, he said, I wonder, then he threw the man in the prison with those tortures that were there to torture him until he will pay back everything. They, was, they were subjugated to unimaginable work to do, and the value of that work was divided between prison and the master, and they were keeping them there for 20 years, working for nothing, to pay a, a small debt that had. I read the other day that uh, if a person has like a loan of $3,000 from the bank and pays the minimum payment, a person of 30 years old, a person, and uh, if that person pays minimum, uh, minimum payment, 
uh, the debt will be paid in 45 years. That's, that's the system. This is the same system. Nothing changed too much. It's just names or colors, or, but uh, it's the same system. They, people are kept today in the prison of the debtors. They don't even know about that. Yeah. Yeah. They work, but they work for somebody else. Hmm. And they, they never enjoy the fruits of their work. Hmm. So that happened to that man. He threw his friend in prison to be tor tortured and treated like that for a long time, for just an, an infinitesimal, a, a little, absolutely nothing that compared with what he had before. Now that's the main point that I want you to understand. What, uh, first of all, who, uh, the, he was called back by the master. Some people saw the, the, what happened there. They told the master, you know what happened to the man you forgave me for? No. He met his friend and he did that to him. Uh, uh, the master said, bring him over here. Mm -hmm. he, they brought him back in the same court where he was before. Oh, yeah. In the same court. And the Lord told him, you are a wicked servant. Oh, yeah. So uh, now I have two questions for you. What was the... He was thrown in prison mm -hmm. for life and forever. I read the other day that he needed 12 lives, 12 lives, in order to pay that debt. In 12, if he would, he would have lived 12 lives, wow. he, then he would have paid that. Otherwise, that, that was astronomical. So you heard that many people got many life sentences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that guy, this guy got 12 life sentences wow. to pay that debt. That was impossible. Now, I want you to tell me, there were two reasons, two things that I want you to, to cooperate with me and uh, find out together. Who put this man in prison? He did. He did. He did. Himself. That's the right answer. I told you the other Sabbath that I met a lady with a broken arm the other week in Vidalia. And I asked her, how long are you going to keep your cast on your arm? She said, uh, uh, six weeks. I said, who decided that? She said, the doctor. I said, wrong. It was not the doctor who decided that you would keep the cast for six weeks. It was the bone. <laughs> the bone is the one. The doctor only told you what the bone said. <laughs> That's all. The doctor told you your bone said that you should keep the cast for six weeks and it's going to be all right. It was not the master who put this man back in prison. The master is the one who forgave the debt of this man, who gave him his freedom and everything back. That's the master. Don't accuse God. No. It's, it's toxic to your own soul. Don't do that, because God is not that one. If I am back in prison, if I am in prison, it is because of me. Amen. Uh, concerning God, yes, I can say that he did everything for me to be free. But the way I use my freedom. That was the way. Uh, in the book of Job, and in few other places in the Bible, the Bible speaks clearly and transparently. You are the one that destroy your own life. And you accuse other people around you, and you accuse God in the end. You know, uh, our parents in the garden, they were more honest than we are. You know why? Because they said, the devil made me do it. <laughs> what are we saying today? No, we don't say that. We say, God made me do it. It, it was transferred, it was removed. It was moved in, in the wrong direction. Completely the wrong direction. It seems like it is the arbitrary decision of God, a certain course in life that we have today. Our sufferings for our mistakes and the wrong decisions, we project those on God. It's not true. No. This man, he put himself in the same prison where he threw his brother a little before. He didn't know he would join him just a few minutes later. Mm. Because the Bible says, with the measure you measure, in fact, you measure to yourself. When he threw the other brother in the prison, 
He didn't know. He forgot to tell him, keep the door open because I will follow you right away. And it happened. Imagine that man in the prison, heard, heard, uh, hearing the guard opening the lock. They, they're bringing another prisoner here, another death or they saw, they thought. And when he saw who he was, back in Romania, there is a huge history. I don't want to, you to just, I want you just to know that it exists, but I don't want you to get into details. It's not good to know the tortures that Christians suffered under communism. It's not to be told, just the idea. But there was an uh, officer, a communist uh, administrator, torturer, that beat to death a priest for his faith. He ruined completely his lungs, his liver, his stomach, his bones. Everything was completely destroyed. And they put this elderly priest in prison, and he was laying on a bed, on the deathbed, dying. But somewhere toward the midnight, the door, the door was unlocked, and they put another prison inside, another prisoner inside. Who was that man? The same person who tortured this priest. Mm. I don't want to get into details, but the priest prayed for that man to the last breath. And he literally was Jesus undercover. He prayed for his torturer with an open heart. I think that man, owing a little debt, prayed for the other one when he saw him there. You know that this guy that had that astronomical death, he had family. He had children, he has a wife, his wife. Imagine how he brought his family through this kind of trouble, unimaginable troubles. What kind of tension was in the heart of the children knowing that their father is judged, no one, uh, is he gonna be condemned, is what would happen? They understood the danger. Imagine through what they, they took. Then imagine the joy that they had, the children and the wife and the family, the joy they had when they learned that the man was forgiven. But that didn't last long. Now you have to tell me, it's my second question, you answered very good at the first one. You told me that he put himself back in prison, very good answer. Now I have the second question, what was the reason he put himself back in prison? You have to think very well. It's simple, but at the same time, it takes a lot of, of mental effort. What was the reason? Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. That was the manifestation. He manifested himself as an unforgiving person. But what was the reason? Lack of conversion. Lack of conversion. Very good. This is the answer. This is the answer. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So he refused transformation. Mm -hmm. The forgiveness of the master intended to transform that man from an unforgiving man into a forgiving man, according to the example of the master. I want you to be like me. Look at me, what I am doing to you. And I want you to do the same to others. That was the message. In the forgiveness, there was power to transform this life. But he wanted only the forgiveness, but not the transformation. God doesn't do this kind of works. The Word of God has power in itself and transforms. And we can deceive ourselves thinking that we can accept the benefit of forgiveness or of the grace of God, but in the same time refusing to be transformed by the same word of God. Because he rejected transformation, that's why he came back to prison. But something practical now. Look at me, please. Which, which one of you would be forgiven 10,000 talents of gold, which is 500,000 kilos and it's a million pounds? You, you, these are numbers, astronomical numbers. 
Which one of you being forgiven that astronomical sum would meet somebody who would owe you two dollars outside and you would put a hand in his in his neck and you would throw that person to the ground and would take which one of you I, I want to see a hand. I don't think you would do that. You cannot be that cruel. You cannot be. Humanly speaking, I'm talking humanly speaking. You cannot do that. Then, that's why the, the, the other servants, when they saw this situation, they were indignant. They went back to them and said, we, we, can't, we just can't take this kind of... You just forgive this man that sum of money and he doesn't forgive this, the other. Uh, you, you don't do that in a practical life. And still this man did. Why? Does anybody have an answer? The word of God and faith is a dangerous thing. A very dangerous thing. You are either transformed into the image of God through this word, or by rejecting the transformation, you are transforming the image of the devil. Seven times worse than the natural man. No natural man would have ever been forgiven so much put the hand in the other person that no natural person would have done. But a person that rejected the grace of God and rejected the transformation, that person became seven times worse than before. Wow. That's why he did that. The word of God, you wanted to say something. Uh, I remember in uh, the Christ tell that Pakatu uh, destroys moral. Yes, sin destroys moral sense in us. Not only sin destroys moral sense, but installs something demonic in us. A Christian that trampled under his foot the grace of God, it's not a natural person or an ordinary person. A person whose heart was healed by God and the Word of God says the evil spirit that was there before is trying to come back in the same heart and when he finds that heart empty he takes other seven evil spirits with him and they occupy that heart and the final stage the situation of that man becomes seven times worse than it was before this is what happened to this man the other servants would have never done that they were not forgiven that amount of money. But they would have never done that. That's why they were indignant. They said, no, that this is not possible to be forgiven uh, this way and be in the same time to be such an unforgiving person. They never saw that kind of cruelty from a person who was forgiven that, that astronomical amount of, of money. This happens. So it is a privilege to know the Word of God. It's the only way that our lives will be transformed in the image of God. But there is a great danger in the same time. Trifling with the Word of God or rejecting the transformation. Don't let Him get work in us. Transform us completely. What happened with that man with the great debtor when he put his hand in the other person neck. What happened to, to him? He lost completely his faith in the forgiveness of God. God became somebody according to his own image. Unforgiving like his what he was. That happens when we practice sin or lawlessness or unfor unforgiveness or ungratefulness. We see God in the same light. He lost completely his faith in the forgiveness that he just received. And he was transformed, not in the image of the forgiving master, but in the image of un the unforgiving devil. You didn't ever hear about the devil forgiving somebody. <laughs> you just love to go there. Yeah. You cannot attach these two words, forgiveness and, and the devil. And this man, 
became in, who was transformed in the image of the devil. I would like to take with you just a moment to talk about uh, the last point of our today's presentation. We are called on earth to be ambassadors of the forgiveness of God. When you forgive somebody, you know what you do? Maybe not. You are not using your intellectual powers or spiritual powers or your, your character. You are not using those because you are not that kind of a person. Nothing good resides in me. When you forgive somebody, you are simply, literally conveying the forgiveness you received from God. You are conveying that to your neighbor. You become an ambassador of the forgiveness of God. Okay. Through the way you forgive your brother, your brother comes to know God. He sees God as a forgiving God, forgiving God because of your forgiveness. That's, that's our calling on earth, to be ambassadors of forgiveness. I would like, in closing, to read a few texts that uh, are of great importance for us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 to 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I don't understand. Am I forgiven by forgiving? Is this a, is this a, a deal between me and God? Uh, you forgive me if I forgive, so I forgive because I want to be forgiven. Is this a kind of, of a deal? We just talked before that forgiveness is, is the, the unilateral decision of God according to his character. It doesn't depend on anything in our lives. And here you read that if you forgive other people, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other, their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. <coughs> What's the mystery here? Mm -hmm. Forgiveness either belongs to God completely or is a transaction between us. We exchange money. I forgive you, forgive. I forgive you, forgive. No. Uh, forgiveness is purely the initiative of God, unilateral, absolutely unconditional. He didn't ask me if I want to be forgiven or not. He forgave me anyhow. If we'll accept, if I will accept forgiveness, that will be part of my life. If I will reject it, I will never have it. But as far as God did, He forgave my sins unilaterally and unconditionally. He didn't wait for my confession or for anything like that. If I confess, I don't confess for God. I don't inform God about what I did. If I confess, I confess for my own soul. I want to get rid of that aspect of it in my life. But when you don't forgive, then the image of God in your mind is completely transformed. You come to see God and as unforgiving as you are. That's the problem. When you forgive, you come to see God as forgiving as you are. If you are an unforgiving person, you have an unforgiving God. If you are a forgiving person, you have a forgiving God. That's the simple equation. You know, it's, it circulated long for years that a church would not go over the level of her pastor they said everywhere. It's not true. What is true is that a church will never go above the level of the image of God that church has. Mm. That's the level. The image of God dictates the course that will take in life. So this is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. That's the last verse in the parable. This, is the, this will happen to you. You'll be back in that prison, in the prison of the devil. If you don't forgive 
from your heart. Not just forgive, yes, I forgive you. No. Do you literally really feel in your heart? There are two signs that indicate that your heart is where your words are. If you forgive a person, the sign that you forgive from your heart is that you wish good for that person. You wish the happiness and the blessing of that person. You go and pray for that person. You tell God, I want you to bless this person, Lord. That's the complete cycle of forgiveness. A, a simple expression, yes, I'm sorry, yeah, I forgive you, so, or something like that, that doesn't work. Jesus said, this will happen if you don't forgive from all your heart. Dears, I pray that the Lord will imprint these words in our hearts. It's an extremely serious matter. It will not remain without consequences. Don't deceive yourself, says the word of God. Don't deceive. It's something, it's a matter, it's a life and death matter. You don't put anybody in prison when you hate or don't forgive. You don't put anybody in prison. You put yourself in prison. That's, right. That's the prison. And when you forgive, then you set yourself free out of that prison. That's all. But it's not God or your neighbor who puts you in prison. It's you yourself by the unforgiving spirit. The key of freedom is in your pocket. An illustration that was in, it was again here in, uh, in Europe. Preacher, the third. He had a brother, and that brother was a, a glutton. He was eating like animals, unimaginable. And he put his brother in prison for treason. And many people protested and said, why don't you set free your brother? He said, freedom is in his pocket. He can be free any moment, any time he can be free. The king left an opening in the wall. It was narrow, a narrow passage. But with that kind of a body, he could not go through that opening. Another person very easily could have, for example, you ran. You would have, you would have been free in day one. <laughs> not me that soon, but still, still I could. Uh, but what happened was that in the, uh, on the, at the windowsill, it was a lot of food. A lot of turkeys and chickens and everything was ours. 